She's done geriatric podiatry fellowships and all of that. And the thing that is so cool is that not only do all of the orthopedic physician residents have to rotate with podiatry, so do our geriatric fellows in training. And they learn a phenomenal amount. And I think that we cannot, I mean, just this last talk that you had with Dr. Oakes and the, the importance of foot care is so clear and obvious just when you talk about things and getting confined to wheelchair for two months or two weeks or whatever it is at a young age, let alone at an older age, and just attempting to walk. And you did see that incredible toenail yesterday, didn't you, from the derm person. So uh, this is all vital. So I think you'll find it very interesting. Thank you. Good to see you. Sure. Um, thank you. It's great to be here and talk about one of my favorite topics, <laughs> feet. Um, first, I'd like to see or kind of get an assessment of how many people provide foot care. Anyone here? Okay, so this is all new to you. And, you know, in terms of nail debridement or calluses or that kind of thing. No, no. teeth. Teeth. No, nurse. We have some nursing <laughs> folks who do a little of that. Okay, because she pointed to her and teeth. We've got a lot of teeth. She's teeth. dental. Yes. Okay. Oh, all right. No. Well, <laughs> so this should all be new to you, hopefully, and. Um, I hope to, you know, I'll introduce you a little bit into, in terms of some of the different pathology and hopefully by the time I'm done with my lecture, you kind of know why foot care is important. I kind of have to stand over here, I think. Hold on, that's the end. Let's go back to home. We all know the numbers. We know that our, we are living longer. Our life expectancies are definitely higher than they were previously. According to the CDC in, 2000, in 2030, not even 2000, 2030, I guess you could say, one out of four patients will be 65 years or, and older. Of these patients, and most and important to us is something that we need to think about, regardless of what we do, one in three of these patients would have diabetes. So there's going to be increased prevalence of lower extremity pathology. Foot care will be important for a number of reasons. The lack of foot care will lead to less mobility. You've already heard a lot about that as well as ambulation, which has a significant impact on, on patient on performance of ADLs, um, activities they live in. And of course, in our patients with diabetes and neuropathy and that run the gamut of different complications, a risk of ulceration and amputation is inherent. So um, we need to pay attention to some of the changes that happen to, to our patients as they get older. As we get older, as all of us get older, uh, we go through some biomechanical changes in the foot and ankles and hands and et cetera. But, but our feet being weight-bearing surfaces certainly um, suffer, I think, more than any other part of the body. The foot gets wider, the foot gets longer. You may need a bigger size shoe, even though we, sometimes it's hard for us to admit that. Mm -hmm. um, you start to lose support in the foot. The, the, the muscles become atrophic. You lose, um, you, know, you, you, you lose your arch support. You, know, you get some collapse of your medial arch. And you just lose the turgor and texture and the suppleness of the skin and the soft tissues. In some cases, and in most cases, it becomes more limited in terms of joint mobility. It doesn't, and, and, it, and it has potential, depending on disease disorders, to become rigid. So those are all things that we need to look at and also accommodate as, as we need to. So who's at risk for foot problems? Certainly not every patient is at risk for developing problems, but have you ever heard that if your feet don't feel good, then you don't feel good, right? I mean, you know, basically. So it is true. Um, probably one of the most common reasons we see patients is for nail care, okay? A number of different ma nail pathologies. There are books written on different nail disorders. It's amazing. Um, mycotic nail, certainly we all are familiar with the mycotic nail, which is the nail that is fungally infected. Pincer nails are nails that pinch both sides of the nail, um, uh, nail borders, which certainly can predispose to ingrown nails. Your incurvated nails are exactly what it sounds like. It can be incurvated on one side or it can be incurvated on both sides. Dystrophic nails kind of um, uh, goes hand in hand with all these different types because anything abnormal with the nails is a dystrophic nail. Ingrown nails are probably something that all of us may have experienced at one time or another, whether it be your fingers or your toenails. And so that certainly can cause some disability. And subuncal hematomas, which is usually uh, a result of trauma. So I'll go through each of these kind of briefly, one at a time. 
Unfortunately, the most common nail problem that we see is neglect of our older patients that are not um, evaluated, either whether it's hands, we've all had our fair share of patients who have not been treated well, whether it's hands or feet or you know, even as, if, if it's just skin care. So unfortunately, this is, this is one of the reasons that you know, you know that they're at high risk for other issues because then there are hygiene issues, there are care issues, neglect issues, and something that we as um, geriatric caregivers need to consider. Nail care, very simply, is to get the patient to have nails um, cut fairly frequently. Um, the average nail takes about six to nine months to grow out. In our older patients, it can take a little bit longer, but these are patients that you need to keep trimmed, um, cut their nails straight across, see them probably about every three to four months, regardless of their state. A lot of our patients have vision problems, they have sensation problems, so in order to protect them, this is gonna be the patient that I see every three to four months, regardless, okay? Ingrown nails, usually associated with abnormal interaction between the nail plate and the tissues surrounding it, the periungal tissues, tissues. Patient presents with pain, inflammation. If it's chronic, can, they can develop uh, an abscess or cellulitis extending from the nail border. There are a number of different ideologies. Um, the anatomy of the, of the nail, some of us are inherently born with nails that are pincer type or incurvated. Nothing you can do about it, it's all about your genetics. Improper trimming, there's too many patients that try to cut their nails in a moon, in a half moon um, type fashion. Well, that leaves spicules or bits of nails on the side that haven't been resected appropriately and those can predispose to ingrown nails. Subungal, um, sub subungal exostosis, which is basically a bony um, overgrowth of the distal phalanx underneath the nail, when your nail conforms to that bone. And so you can develop a pincer or incurvated nail around that. Trauma, any kind of trauma. Um, we get a lot, of, a lot of people who bump their toe, or it can be secondary to poor fitting shoe gear that rubs the nail next to the nail, nail border, and that can be disposed to an ingrown nail as well. And finally, some of the many bio biomechanical deformities that can predispose. Bunion deformities, your toe is rotated in your shoe, so that can predispose to an ingrown nail. If you have a hammer toe, and that coupled with trauma can certainly um, increase that. Oh, I went back to end. One second. I need a better way of doing this. I'm sorry. So how do we treat ingrown nails? The first and most important thing is to, rem to, to remove the offending portion of the nail. Um, sometimes we need to remove both parts, sometimes we need to remove the entire nail, but really debriding the nail border is the best way. We remove the offending, offending portion and it goes away. A partial nail avulsion is also an option, um, in which, which will require anesthesia to the toe and you remove the entire um, aspect, medial lateral aspect of the nail, including the nail matrix where it grows from. You can elect a matrixectomy in which you are killing the nail permanently with a chemical, whether it's phenol or sodium hydroxide. And finally, there's a big debate of whether or not antibiotics are really of use in ingrown nails. Most of the time, and if you think of any time that you've traumatized your nail or whenever you saw an area of redness, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're infected. I mean, we're all medical people, we know that. A lot of time, inflammation can mimic um, infection. So, you don't need antibiotics for infection. It's the same thing with ingrown nail. But people are often feared. People fear the feet and you know, some of the manifestations, that, especially if you're dealing with a patient who's at risk. And so antibiotics can tend to be overused in this, in, in this uh, type of pathology. Um, the only times that I would probably consider an antibiotic is if the patient presents with cellulitis, ascending, or lymphangitis. So if they have redness that's extending um, towards the, the top of the foot. Subungal so hematoma, we've all had our fair share probably, if you've, ever, if you've ever banged your toe into anything or banged your finger in a car door, um, you developed a blood clot underneath your nail. Um, the biggest question with treating, so it's mostly secondary to trauma. Um, in some of our patients with neuropathy, we see this after wearing a bad pair of shoes over, you know, after two or three hours. Um, when do you d remove the nail? There's a lot of controversy around this. The first is if the nail obviously is not firmly adhered to the nail bed, then you, know, you finish the work. You numb the toe up and you remove the rest of it. If you have more than 50% of the nail plate that is involved, or if you have active bleeding, or if you are um, worried about an open fracture, meaning you have a distal phalangeal fracture and you have a laceration through the, through the nail bed, then you need to remove the nail so you can truly assess it. 
Hyperkeratotic lesions, simply calluses and corns, can be very problematic, can be very painful. They're a sign of increased pressure and exacerbated by different shoes. Um, in patients with neuropathy, these are real live patients. Some of you that are like, oh, these are real life. These are my patients I've taken photos of, or patients that we've shared in, in terms of uh, the department. Patients with neuropathy, these are going to be ex ex extremely problematic because they're an indication of increased pressures and hence a risk for ulceration. These wounds, these, um, well, these lesions need to be debrided every visit, and you can accommodate these with prescription insoles and just regular debridement, okay? But they're a sign of pressure. I know all of you have heard the terms corns and calluses. There really is a difference. A difference. They are hyperkeratotic lesions. However, corns are tend to be more in the on the dorsum of the foot. Okay, softer skin, and your calluses are more plantar. So, but there are different types of corns. Also, the medical word for corn is holoma. So, holoma molly, molly meaning soft, not mole. Because <laughs> I remember when I came to San Antonio, that mole meant something different than soft. But um, a holoma molly is a soft corn, usually between toes. And the reason that develops is you have continued friction between, usually in that fourth interspace, between toes four and five, that you have um, continued friction, first develops into a hyperkeratotic lesion, but then because the interspaces are inherently moist, it becomes wet and it looks like this, okay? Holoma durum are, is a hard corn. You know that dura or durum is, it means hard. And so these are lesions that usually present on the top of the toes usually as a manifestation of shoe gear against the deformity, such as a hammer toe, okay? Um, the medical word for callus is tyloma. And so your tylomas tend to be more plantar. Your, um, the, and that's why you develop calluses maybe in the palm of your hand or in the plantar aspect of your foot, okay? These are all signs of pressure, and, they're, and you can be very general, call it hyperkeratotic lesions. Moving on to the next pathology and the next thing we need to evaluate in our patients that complain of pain is pain in the forefoot, aka metatarsalgia. Your metatarsals, of course, are in the forefoot, so any kind of pain or, or issues that you have around that area, we use a nonspecific term, which is metatarsalgia. Uh, there's a huge laundry list of differential diagnosis, and it could be your calluses, as, I, as, I, as you can see, let's see if I can use this today. As you can see uh, photographed here, different tylomas or calluses. Um, what happens in our, in our older patients is you get thinning of the fat pad that's underneath the metatarsal heads, and so that can certainly predispose to hyperkeratotic lesions. Um, the fat pad also tends to migrate underneath the toes here, so that leaves this area vulnerable to metatarsals leading to hyperkeratotic lesions as well. Other differentials include sesamoiditis underneath the first ray, um, synovitis or bursitis, different neuroma uh, pain as well. Uh, these patients are predisposed to stress fractures or even arthritis, and this is all generalized pain to the forefoot of the, of the uh, of p that patients tend to complain with. Warts, Veruca plantaris, a viral etiology, okay, quite common actually, um, and, and, if, and in our older patients, those who like to go barefoot or like to walk around in, in wet areas, or you, we find our, our patients who are active, you know, and they go to, to community pool areas are predisposed to plantar, plantar warts. Treatment for this, um, probably the most common in, in office treatment is cryotherapy. Uh, patients are encouraged to apply like a salicylic acid to help debride that, the, um, the, the verruca tissue as well, or excision if, the, if it's recalcitrant to the other treatments. There has been some um, discussion of use of um, H2 antagonists such as cimetidine and um, um, tagament, all the same, to, because of their immunomodular, modulatory um, activities. And, but it's, it's been found to be more effective in kids. There's not any research really in adults. But just for completeness sake, I, I told you that. Um, you would never think that dry skin could be such a problem. But in our older patients, it certainly is. And it's all because of lack of hydration. Xerosis, which is dry skin, or fissures. And you can see the cracking here. This is a great example of it. And the, the primary ideology is lack of emollient, a lack of hydration. Um, there's a high potential for infection because these wounds are in a vulnerable area. And you never know what's in the back of your heels. If you, if you, don't, if you wear clogs or shoes that, don't, that, are, that are backless, you're certainly at risk for more, for more complications. Treatment of this, 
is essentially using a urea-based cream um, to, in order to help debride some of the hyperkeratotic tissue that you see plantarly there and to keep it moist. Um, if the patient has, God forbid, active bleeding, but fissures sometimes will crack because if they're fresh fissures, just like any other break in the skin, you'll get a little bit of bleeding. We tend to coagulate it with a silver nitrate, essentially burn it so it can heal over. And then in some patients, I, I recommend that they utilize once the dryness and the hyperkeratotic tissue has um, you know, uh, resolved to maintain it with a petroleum-based cream under occlusion, like a Vaseline petroleum jelly, except not between the toes, because that's a moist area anyway, but on the plantar aspect of the feet, and then wear socks. Some docs tell them to use saran wrap you know, under occlusion, so that's also effective for this, for this problem. But very common, we see a lot of patients with fissures. All of us have had a fair share of athlete's foot, but maybe not like this, Okay, athlete's foot is a fungal infection of the skin, of the plantar aspect of the foot. There are a number of different types. Probably the most common include the vesicular, in a moccasin type appearance of the foot, and interdigital. High potential for infection. We see a lot of patients, whether they're immunosuppressed or not, that develop back secondary bacterial infections because of athlete's foot. So it's something that you can't ignore. Treatment for athlete's foot very simply is an antifungal therapy. Usually a topical is effective. In a condition like this where you have epidermolysis where the skin has peeled away, patient has some cellulitis. This is someone we had to admit for a short term of IV antibiotics and then you can treat them topically after that's cleared. Dishydrotic eczema is a differential of, tini of tinea pedis and this is basically a type of eczema that that uh, presents as clear vesicles on a non erythematous base on the foot here. Something that looks kind of like a pimple, but it really is filled with fluid, just, um, you know, serous fluid. Very common in summer months. Some people are more predisposed than others. Those who have excessive sweating or hyperhidrosis are, are, are predisposed. One other thing that we notice in our clinics are our patients who are a little bit more anxious or nervous because they, and then they sweat more, and then they tend to develop a dishydrotic eczema more than, more than others. Treatment for this very simply is a topical steroid. If you give a patient an antifungal for this, it's not gonna go away. So sometimes we get patients who have a mix of both because hyperhidrosis also can predispose you to tinea pedis. So there are a lot of creams that are antifungal and anti-inflammatory steroids, and so it kind of solves the problem. But you really should try to, you know, try to determine what the, what the ideology is. Macerated interspaces can include athlete's foot. It can include just poor hygiene or, or just you know, failure to dry between the toes. And it can include a bacterial infection that we call erythrasma. And they're treated in, very, in three very different ways. And they're diagnosed in very different ways. As you know from the previous slides, tinea pedis is a fungal infection. Uh, moisture between the toes, you're not gonna get a positive culture for anything. That's just, you know, um, in terms of care. And erythrasma, of course, your fungal culture would be negative, but your bacterial culture would be positive. So you diagnose these problems based on a KOH, which is for your fungal, or uh, different types of cultures, a fungal culture, a bacterial culture. Treatment is based on whatever the ideology is. Um, a tinea pedis, again, antifungal solution between the toes. You really should use a solution and not a cream because it makes it too moist. Um, if you have moisture, making sure that you dry between the toes, and we try to get our patients to do that every day. Um, it's a little bit harder with our older patients, a little bit harder with our patients that can't see or aren't able to, to, to get to their feet, but we still encourage them to do that. And finally, if you're a thrasma, topical erythromycin is the treatment of choice. We have a slew of patients with ulcerations of the feet and ankle. Venous stasis ulcers are, is actually quite common. Ideology is valvular incompetence or venous insufficiency or venous congestion of the feet. Very common in our older patients. Um, these wounds tend to manifest at the medial aspect of the leg or ankle, and really the treatment for these is compression. Whether you, whatever your, your choice of compression is, Unaboot, or it may be um, some of the more specialized uh, compression systems that exist now. But re reducing the edema is imperative, um, as well as a, an appropriate wound care regimen. And these patients you maintain with compression stockings. Decubitus ulcers is a, is, a, is a huge downfall, I think, still, regardless, regardless of what um, type of medical facility you're working in. They're, they're far too common. They shouldn't be as common as they are. 
We still experience it here in University Hospital when patients have, go for heart surgery or immobilized for long periods of time. The surgeons and the docs are, and I'm a surgeon too, so don't, you know, but <laughs> I mean, the docs are so focused on the cardiac manifestations that they leave the legs alone. And so they're not offloaded, and so they develop decubitus wounds like this, or sacral wounds. Um, risk factors for decubiti include immobility, um, a patient who doesn't have good sensation because they don't know that it's starting to bother them because of the pressure necrosis. Inactivity or a previous history of pressure ulcers. That should give you a huge um, hint that this patient's at risk. Treatment is mostly supportive. Um, the number one treatment is prevention, but treatment is supportive. There are a number of different devices to offload the legs. There are um, a lot of modifications to different beds now that this should really not be a problem for us anymore, but it still is. And finally, in those patients that you suspect vascular disease, you call in your vascular surgeons. Moving on to other problems that we see in our, in our geriatric population includes biomechanical deformities. Now, a lot of these may look familiar to a lot of you because we all have a lot of these different problems. The first are your digital deformities, which I'll go through very briefly. Um, your bunion deformities, those of us with flat feet or high arch feet, arthritis complaints, neuromas, and finally, heel pain. Digital deformities, there are three main types of digital deformities. There's a hammer toe, which, which basically presents as a contracture of the proximal interphalangeal joint. The mallet toe is a contracture of the distal interphalangeal joint, which is here, and your claw toe is a contracture of both. So you can see here that this patient has, what, a hammer toe, right? Okay, these are problems because they, they are, they encourage um, hyperkeratotic lesion formation, um, especially in shoes, like if you try to get this foot into a shoe, you know it's gonna rub against whatever you, whatever you, put, you put it in, unless it's like a sandal, okay? Um, and so these can be quite painful or quite you know, problematic. They can be conservatively managed. There are a lot of different, you know, corn pads that are on the market. There are some that are medicated, which are a huge no-no. Tell all your patients, especially our older patients, not to use your medicated pads. Because the medicated pads have the felt with the, with the um, aperture, and it tells you, and you're instructed to put medis medication in that aperture, and it eats away at the hyperkeratotic tissue, but it doesn't know when to stop. So it'll go clear to your bone if you don't know when to stop. And a lot of our patients don't know when to stop, okay? Um, so the best treatment, if you're going to try conservative care for a patient who has a mild deformity, is just the, the, the corn pad itself without medication, okay? But usually, if this is a rigid deformity, then it usually is an indication for surgical, for surgical management. And we basically will make an incision and, and, you know, resect the head of whatever bone that's a problem, and patients do well because the toes straight and no longer a problem. Fairly minor procedure, but... Um, the next and probably one of the most common reasons behind, besides heel pain and nail problems that we see patients in our clinics are bunion problems. Um, this can include a hallux valgus deformity, valgus meaning the big toe is, in, is it rotated, or a hallux limitus, in which you have arthritis in the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. And these are all inherited, it's congenital, okay? So, if you really want to know if you're at risk for bunions, go look at your mom's or your dad's or grandma's or grandpa's feet. Mm -hmm. Question? So, um, surgically, if you surgically remove, you surgically, is that something you surgically remove? Uh-huh. You can conserve. Well, you know, these patients come to you, and, you know, we see a lot of patients late in life because it hasn't bothered them. And if they wore shoes that maybe, you know, they, they paid attention to the foot and accommodated deformity, a lot of times they don't have problems until late in life and they're like, it's just hard for me to walk around. They complain of calluses because what's happening is this first metatarsal phalangeal joint is not functioning as it should, so you develop, you find the other joints trying to make up for that. Well, they, they can't. And so you, you develop the calluses in the bottom of the feet. You can develop you know, the second toe overriding over the first. I have a good picture of that a little bit later. And in a patient who is at risk because of neuropathy, they can develop a wound here. That's when you know you have to interfere. So there really is no conservative treatment for this problem. You can accommodate it in a shoe, and your shoe will get wider and wider and wider, and after a while, there, there's no such thing as a triple F shoe. Okay, or maybe there is, but. Um, so surgery is really the best way of treating these. 
in patients that are able to handle it medically or medically cleared. And in order to fix this, you can't just shave off the bump. There's a, I wish I had an x-ray here, but you can't just shave the bump off because remember, it's a structural deformity. You shave the bump off initially, and then you need to pretty much break the bone, move it over, hold it together with a screw, uh, absorbable pin, because you know. it's always rotated, so you have to straighten it And you have to do, sometimes you can derotate rotate that toe, sometimes you can, because what happens is all the muscles get twisted. You can't untwist it over time, but you can move it over back in position. And a lot of times if you de decompress that joint, you're able to do that. Someone else had a question up here. I think your explanation Oh, well, surgically, well, maybe it's my hands, but uh, <laughs> I will tell you that bunions are painful because with every step you take, the main joint that, you know, helps to propel you through gait cycle is that first metatarsophalangeal joint. So preoperatively, most patients will complain of an achy, sometimes sharp pain, sometimes just inability to walk. But surgically, and I don't know if it's because I sit and I talk to my patients so they know my expectations and they know their expectations, but... Most patients don't complain too much after bunion surgery. For one thing, because it's, you see, we're lucky because everything we do is elective for the most part, except our diabetic patients who are sick. So, you know, a lot of times it's not an infected bunion that you have to go in and take care of that. Um, so I think expectations have a lot to do with it. And, you know, bone, bone surgery hurts, yes, but we load them up with Marcane, we, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we take care of that pain aspect of it. I'm sorry? What's the recovery? It depends on what's done. There are three levels where you can fix a bunion. You can fix it here at the joint. If the patient has arthritis, it's a different type of procedure than here at the mid shaft of this bone. And finally, the base of the bone. So some patients have such a significant deformity that you need to go back to the base of the bone. And, you're deal and that's a much more intense procedure because you're, you're resecting the joint and then you're fusing it. And so in order for any bone to fuse, you need a minimum of eight weeks on, on crutches. What hurts about bunion surgery is when patients don't have pain and they go to the mall and they go walk around. And then you develop edema and edema is painful. Swelling is painful. And that's usually what hurts with any kind of foot surgery. Because you can't help it. It's not like a hand where you can go walk in the mall and kind of do this. You've got to keep your foot elevated with foot surgery. Any other questions? I've, I've had uh, foot surgery and I've had, uh, I've had corns removed. And I think that's got to be the word. I've had c sections that didn't hurt. <laughs> Whoa, well, you went to the wrong doctor. But everybody's looking at your feet. Um, <laughs> well, it depends because podiatry, sometimes we're a little bit, I guess you could say, liberal. Um, podiatry used to be, and I'm not I'm going to the history of podiatry, but we used to be the kind of, um, our career, those, those who chose podiatry as a career, it's, it was an office career. Like a lot of people had their surgeries done in offices, not necessarily in the hospital where you don't have, I mean, they're short procedures and most of the time you can do it in the office. And even at, at our clinic, um, the Texas Diabetes Institute, we have an uh, operating room there, but I reserve those for those patients that I'm going to be in and out because I want you to have a great experience. Um, when they just sedate you here at University Hospital and I numb around your foot, you're not feeling a thing. And if you stay off your foot, you're not feeling a thing. So it really depends on what they did and how they did it. Yeah. And you know, it, was so, it was long, long ago that I had everything. I'm sure a lot of things have changed. Was it in an office? Uh, it was in an office. It was in New York. That's where I'm from. It was in New York that I had it done. But um, what, I, what, I, what I found was, I guess, was kind of disappointing to me. I had to go in for, for one thing to be done, and I ended up with other deformities when I'm done. I don't know if it's the removal of so much bone or, or your toes are not straight as you thought they would be. They were, at least they were straight before. You sure. just had corn on them. Right, <laughs> you know, exactly. You know, so that, that can be. And a lot of times patients will come in, and I'll show you a picture of what I'm talking about, going back to bunions. They'll come in and they'll complain of that second toe crossing over their bunion because their bunion's so severe that the second toe does this. Well, I can't fix this without fixing this. I mean, you know, unless you want me to amputate your toe. And that's been done before, too. And our older patients who are like, the only thing that hurts is my toe. Don't touch this. I'm fine with this. I'm like, well, okay, you know. But I mean, that's very, very rare. You really want to fix the second toe and fix the fix the the, the um, first metatarsal joint as well. So the foot is very tricky. 
because I can't I can't predict if I've if I've operated you when you're on the, when you're 20 what you're going to do in the future and if you're going to be on your feet and if it's going to exacerbate if your foot's going to collapse if you're going to have 10 kids versus none and you know the effect of that on your feet that's aging neuromas neuromas um, result in pain not only in the toes but usually patients will complain of a stabbing or a sharp pain around the metatarsal area this is the forefoot, the midfoot, the, the, the forefoot area, and these are metatarsals. And you can see that you have nerves, of course, in every inner space, but there's an enlargement here because those bones are rubbing against that neuroma, um, against the nerve and making it large and therefore making it an aroma. Treatment for this very, um, we diagnostically evaluate it with an injection um, because if it goes away, of course, in the pain, it's all about an aroma. Um, sometimes we may apply a pad you can see back here to offload the area, and here it's removable. Or you, you know, you it, you allow it to by by taping it and taping the foot, you allow it to stay longer than than, than uh, patients usually allow. And finally, I really think the neuromas again are a problem that surgical excision is indicated, um, unless you're able to accommodate it with a pad and your shoe and wear the appropriate shoes. A lot of times, a lot of these patients need excision. The flat foot. The flat foot has a slew of, of problems that they present with. This is the foot in which you have a, a valgus attitude of the heel. Okay, so it's pointing outwards. You have abduction of the forefoot. If you look at this patient from the back, you can see their toes. That's not a normal thing. But a lot of people have flat feet, and that's normal for you, but there are different degrees of this. When it's pathologic or painful, then this is the patient that you want to try to accommodate or manage. But this patient has abduction. Patients with flat feet present with abduction of the forefoot on the rear foot. They tend to have, you know, strain, muscle strains, and over, overuse syndromes of different parts of the foot, depending on how active they are. They may develop posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, which is the tendon that's in the medial, in the, in the medial aspect of the ankle. Feels weak, feels like their foot is giving, giving way or giving out underneath them. These are the patients that are predisposed to bunion deformities and hammer toes and you know different plantar fasciitis and those kind of things because everything's just so much more stretched out than the patient with pes cavus, the patient with the high arch foot. These patients tend to have a more rigid deformity. They complain of calluses under the sub one, sub five, and sub heel area, like a tripod foot, kind of, sort of. Um, there are different degrees of this. I mean, not, you're not just a pes planus or pes cavus. You can have a foot that's a cavus type that's flexible, so it, you know when you step down, everything kind of falls down. Everybody's kind of going like this, I know. <laughs> but um, you know, it's every pro every foot has its inherent problems. Also, what we see in a pes cavus type foot is fat pad migration. I told you about the fat pad atrophy and migration towards the front of the foot. Well, we, if you put a lot of pressure in your metatarsal areas, that fat pad moves upwards. And clawing of digits. This is the foot that has a varus heel. We all have seen our fair share of arthritis problems. Arthritis is um, very common among our aging patients. Osteoarthritis, the different types, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, gout. These patients complain of a lot of pain of their joints. A lot of times surgery is the best way to, um, to solve the bunion deformities and the toes, the, the camera toes that they present with. Here's a good example of a crossover second toe over the, over the bunion. Okay, so you can see where the second toe is the main problem or the main reason why they're having pain because of inability to wear shoes. However, the money is the underlying pathology. Psoriatic arthritis and other arthritic conditions can lead to ulceration. So it can be certainly debilitating and it's important to manage and maintain these patients regularly. Heel pain is very common as well. And we see our patients, depending on what kind of activity they're involved in, our older patients can come in complaining of this. This is basically injury or irritation of the plantar fascia at the, at the posterior plantar aspect of the calcaneus, the tubercle. Number of ideologies, there's some neurogenic reasons, you know, nerve entrapments, whether it's your tarsal tunnel nerve, just like you have a carpal tunnel, you have a tarsal tunnel in your foot, um, as well as a medial calcaneal nerve entrapment. Um, treatment for this, first of all, is proper diagnosis, uh, whether you inject the tarsal tunnel or you inject the heel with an uh, anesthetic and a lidocaine, uh, I mean anesthetic and a, and a steroid, like a dexamethasone phosphate or a catalog, um, immobilization, physical therapy, changing shoes, orthotics. Here's a strapping with um, athletic tape to help support the arch, a heel injection, orthotic therapy. These are all um, 
integral in, in treating heel pain. Moving on to a subject that's dear to me because I see so much of it is the diabetic foot. And we know, we all know that diabetes is becoming a true epidemic, at least in the United States, and even in the world, but in the United States because this is what's tangible to us. According to the CDC in 2004, there was a 6.3 prevalence in 2002. More than 15 million in the United States, I'm, I'm sorry, more than 18 million in the United States have diabetes, but more than 5 million don't know it. It always amazes me as a podiatry service even with um, an, our active residency program that we probably diagnose one patient a week, minimum, with, di with diabetes as podiatrists. So because they come into the emergency room with severe infections or neuropathy and you know, have not been evaluated in the past. Diabetes had, was shown to uh, be the sixth leading cause of death in 2000, and especially those between the ages of 45 and 64, but that is changing, the tide is changing every day. Um, diabetes, as we know, affects all organs. We know about its effect in periodontal disease for the dental people here. Um, hypertension, lipoprotein metabolism, and vessel disease. That is the problem with diabetes. And if it's not taken care of early, we know we tend to see the long-term complications of blindness. Uh, patients with nephropathy who require dialysis. Patients with autonomic neuropathy with GI, GU, sexual dysfunction, cardiovascular disease. Peripheral neuropathy, of course, can lead to amputation. Vascular disease and heart attack and stroke, peripheral arterial occlusive disease are also biggies in, in, in this population. We have to remember that our patients, regardless of whatever care that you're giving to them, they're going to heal slower because of the, their hematologic dysgracias or, dis, or, or disorders, clotting fat abnormalities, and their psychosocial issues. I believe there's a diabetic brain disease. Our patients tend to be, they, have, they, they tend to have more denial, they tend to be more depressed, and that's something that you have to factor in the care that you're giving them, no matter what you're doing for them, okay? Um, infected diabetic foot wounds, there are more days spent treating the diabetic foot than other, any other complications. If I ask my patient, or if I tell my patient who is, has chronic hyperglycemia, doesn't seem to understand what they need to do, I tell them, you know, you could go blind. They're like, oh, I can deal with that. I have my husband, and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You know, you um, will probably need dialysis. Well, I think the center's right down the street, so I should be okay. Um, you will probably, I don't know, I throw out, the, you know, you probably have a heart attack. But isn't it going to be silent? Because I have, I mean, they know, you know? But then when you tell them you're going to lose a toe, or you're going to lose a foot, it's the, one, it's the, it's the one thing that they, that they most fear. And it may be cultural, but I think I've practiced in different areas in the country, and I think the diabetic foot problems are the most feared complication than any other complication. And we as practitioners and physicians and caregivers know less about the diabetic foot than anything else. So of course, most hospitalizations are for the diabetic foot. They stay in the hospital more for diabetic foot than any other complication. I mean, you hear patients who are satisposed cabbage who are come, getting out of the ICU like that nowadays, and, but they'll stay in the hospital for two or three months for a diabetic foot infection or wound. So um, the mor mortality and morbidity is significant. Some data out of our institution, we found that 68% of these patients after a first lower extremity amputation um, needed a second, whether it was on the same side or the, a contralateral side within five years, but 50% of these patients were dead within three to five years. So it is significant. What causes that um, second amputation in five years? Well, you know, if you think about it, your feet are basically mirror images. And so if you have a callus because you have a bunion on one side and you have neuropathy, this is soon to follow. And so it takes changing your shoes, changing your insoles, making sure that callus is debrided often. Or um, probably the most devastating is the patient who uh, maybe smoked all their lives and, and, and you know all, all, all his or her life. I mean, it's not unusual to hear people who smoke two packs a day nowadays, I guess. I mean, I don't know why, but we do see that. And so they bump the fifth toe and it turns black immediately. Well, I know that you have severe vascular disease and any kind of trauma on this side, whether it's an ingrown nail or another, another bump to another toe will lead to a baloney amputation. We see that all the time. Um, an interesting sampling, just to put in a little bit of data into the talk for you guys, by Harrington in 2000, he, um, their group found that there was a 7% prevalence of diabetic foot ulcerations among 1995-96 Medicare beneficiaries, but what's really significant, something that I want you guys to think about, is that the cost for treating patients with ulcers was three times higher than treating Medicare uh, patients in general. 
And sadly enough, 70% of these patients got little or no follow-up afterward. So you know the morbidity, and that's another reason for the next amputation. Implications of diabetes is significant. Financially, um, it cost the nation $132 billion in 2002. Um, in direct costs, $92 billion. The, our patients work less, they call in more, they, are, they claim disability earlier in life. When they're at work, they tend to work less. So this all has a significant impact economically. So what can we do? Um, screen high-risk patients, whether it's our patients who have vision loss or if they have protective sensation that has been lost, so you know, they have neuropathy, or if they have diabetes, that certainly puts them at a risk just on its own. Developing programs and increasing awareness like we're doing today, training more people so we know what to look for, and sending them out in an appropriate fashion. Um, I put this in here because I think this is just screening patients in general in terms of ulcer risk. You need to consider if this patient has um, loss of protective sensation, do they have a deformity, do they have a previous history. Um, neuropathy is, is a, you know, neuropathy just doesn't affect the lower extremity, it affects all parts of the body, okay? We know that age is a risk factor, we know that the male gender is a risk factor, um, chronic alcohol use, uncontrolled diabetes, patients who have di had diabetes more than 10 years. This is one of my favorite patients, He's a little bit older, I can't totally remember how, how old he is, but However, it took him the longest time to heal this partial first rate amputation. Yes, he's missing his big toe, in case you didn't notice. But um, it took him a long time to heal this. And actually, you can tell here that that incision is still kind of fragile. He hasn't totally healed it. So, you know, as we do when, when we're seeing patients, I have all my patients in my rooms, and I'm running a little bit late, so I run through. I'm like, oh, hi, Mr. And hi, Mr. And hi, Mr. Whatever. And I stop short in this room, and I'm like, hi, Mr. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, hi, Dr. Michelle, how are you? And I was like, how are you doing? He's like, I'm just fine. I was like, how are your shoes? Oh, they're great. Wear them all the time? Mm-hmm. This is a Miller Lite bottle cap. Can you see that turn the other way that he stepped on? Okay, so he hasn't been wearing his shoes all the time. That's neuropathy. You would say, oh, this patient isn't compliant. He hasn't been compliant in terms of wearing what he needs to do, but he has no idea that he stepped on something. And it might have been from his bed to the shoe over there and he just had no idea. I doubt it, but I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. The difficult, the, the, the difficult, I'm sorry? The beauty and health of diabetes. Exactly, exactly. That's why he's like that. But let's say it's his sons. I don't know. <laughs> but um, you know, they're good excuses always. But I mean, the most devastating thing about this though is he developed a full thickness to cross necrotic ulceration at this area that probed down to the third metatarsal head and he required an amputation there. And then of course he didn't heal because it took him forever to heal this with a bypass. And so, you know, preventing these is the most important thing. Um, we also look at the patient's vascular disease. Remember, vascular disease, it, the entire body, whether they have cardiac problems or stroke or um, neuropathy, nephropathy, which are the small vessels, or retinopathy. Um, your autonomic dysfunctions, such as gastroparesis or sexual dysfunction, these are all things very common in our patients who are older. Uh, family history of, of vascular problems, as well as a social history, if they smoke, drink, etc. cetera. Um, we know how to, mo well, no, you don't know how to provide a physical exam of lower extremities, but you know, feeling for pulses and some of those basic things are also important. Treatment of complications. Regular debridement of calluses and ulcers, promptly treating any infection is very important in these patients. That's considered proper foot care. Giving them the appropriate shoes, insoles, sending them to a podiatrist if you see that they have a problem that can't be maintained, and um, accommodating them well in the appropriate shoe. I will tell you a good athletic shoe is probably appropriate for most of our patients. If they have a significant deformity, you may consider a custom shoe or a San Antonio shoe. All of us have heard of San Antonio shoes. Um, and the, the heart of the shoe is the implant. Is the, I'm sorry, is the insole that you implant in the, in, the, in, the, in the shoe. And so insoles can be prescription insoles. Uh, for the most part, with patients who are high risk, that's what I recommend. For those of us who are not high risk, any kind of insole would probably help in terms of cushioning and that sort of thing. But our specialized patients need specialized insoles. And assisting, telling our patients to follow up with their care, education, self-care, 
you know, diabetes evaluation, nutrition, etc. And I will move on because some of you are cringing. Um, in conclusion, <laughs> hopefully I've um, introduced you to some of the more common foot problems that we see in our older patients, shown you the importance of foot care and how, how, how feet is a, are, are very important. And if you don't know what you're looking at or if you have an issue or a problem, send them to someone who knows, okay? Um, if you have any questions that you can ask me now, but here's my email address as well as our website. You know, it, that's a good question. Diabetes, um, and the way that I, the way that I, um, if you think of someone who has a type two, who's a type two diabetic, most times, at time of diagnosis, they probably had it for five years, and they probably had it for five years uncontrolled. So already, that's against them. If you think about it that way, okay, three to five years. Um, so they need to be in strict control. And most, most people, after 20 years of having diabetes, the natural history is that you'll develop some mm -hmm. level of neuropathy. Okay, but you may not develop any foot problems if you wear the right shoes, go to your foot doctor, and that sort of thing. Um, the, probably the most devastating examples that are see are, are patients who ignore the signs. Because neuropathy hurts. It's like your nerves are constantly being stimulated. There's one stage of neuropathy where it's constantly stimulated. And hyperglycemia, or not controlling your sugar for that period of time, will stimulate those nerves. And so you get all the signs polydipsia, polyuria, and all those other things that we know. Some patients complain of blurry vision at the time. Some persons complain of, of a stimulus, like, you know, they complain of like um, cramping, tingling, sharp pain to their toes, ants crawling up and down their toes. Those are all signs that a lot of patients ignore. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's paying attention to those and knowing what to look for. Mm -hmm. And family history plays a big role, because if you have a family history of patient, of like mom has retinopathy, dad had a BK, you need to be extra careful because you know it's in the, it's in the issue that can happen. Can neuropathy be turned around if it's caught early, or is it just something? It can be reversible, but again, um, you have those five years that it was not diagnosed against you. It is reversible, however, and I often tell patients who say, you know, every now and then I'll get this sharp pain, and I tell them, or they'll get the tingling feeling. I said, at that time, sugar, and you'll see that you're probably hyperglycemic. Do you need to get your sugar? You know. <laughs>